Hey, welcome to the shop. Today we're going to go over the fundamentals that you need to know to be able to MIG weld aluminum. Now we aren't starting from the beginning of MIG welding. I'm assuming you have some experience there, but if not, or if it's been a while and you want a refresher, I'll link some tutorials down in the description that will go over some of the fundamental aspects like how to set up a machine from scratch or just basic MIG welding technique. I'm gonna be using two different machines here today to be able to demonstrate how to do this with you know different feature sets. The first one is a budget-friendly basic machine from Harbor Freight. It's the Titanium MIG 170 and I'm using it with a spool gun. Now, the first thing that's a challenge when it comes to MIG welding aluminum is aluminum wire is softer and harder to feed through your gun. One common solution to this is using a spool gun where the actual spool of wire is put out here at the point of use so it just has to feed a short length straight out this gun. Works really well. I think this is a pretty good setup, especially for the cost. The other machine we're gonna be using is the HTP Pro Pulse 220. It's a little bit more of a professional level machine. I'm gonna be using it with a regular MIG gun today. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I thought you couldn't do that. Well, they've done a bunch of special things to this gun to be able to do it. There's a graphite liner inside. There's special contact tips. And I had to install special drive rolls down in the machine. I've never welded aluminum with a standard MIG gun like this before using this machine, but I gotta tell you, it works really well. And it's nice because it's much more convenient to handle and not as bulky. This also has the advantage of pulse, where the actual amperage coming out pulses between a high and a low setting at a rapid rate. And that helps control the heat input into your material makes it possible to weld very thin metal. Now let's talk about uh, some of the aspects of your setup. First of all, shielding gas. Now aluminum MIG welding requires a different shielding gas than the blends that you might be using for welding steel. It needs straight argon. And in particular, you typically need a much higher flow rate when you're welding aluminum uh, than you might when you're doing some of your short circuit MIG on steel. And so I typically have mine set to somewhere between 35 cubic feet per hour and 50 cubic feet per hour. For those in the metric system, that's right around 17 liters per minute up to 25 liters per minute. Now, another option that you need to pick, no matter what kind of setup you're using, is what type of filler metal you're gonna use. As far as filler metals being compatible with base materials and what kind of properties you get, that's a topic for a different video, but you can Google something called an aluminum filler metal chart. And companies like Alcotec, Aesop, Hobart, they all have a very similar chart that'll come up where you can look at two different base metals you're trying to weld together, or maybe it's the same one. Where that intersects, it'll show you compatible filler metals and what type of properties you could expect. But for the most common alloys out there, there are two filler metals that work uh, pretty well for them, each with some pros and some cons. Let's just talk a little bit about each of these two most common filler materials. The first is 4043. Now 4043, you can typically tell because it's emitting a white light off of your arc, and it tends to have less smoke and soot than the other material we'll talk about in a minute. Now it's alloyed primarily with silicon, which helps it uh, to be fluid and to move along really well. And it typically runs quite a bit hotter. Uh, that way you can weld on thicker material with a uh, you know, similar machine and uh, get just a little bit more out of your machine on it. So it can be nice for that. It is generally softer, so that makes it harder to feed through your gun and it also doesn't take an anodized coating quite as well as the other material we'll talk about. Now 5356 on the other hand, it puts off a green light when you weld and there's more smoke, more soot coming off of it, um, but it's generally stronger and it does take an anodized coating. And the welds are generally not as hot, so that can be an advantage if you're trying to weld really thin material. You can weld it with a 5356 filler metal uh, without putting too much heat in there to burn through. So it can be good for that. But again, make sure you're using something that's gonna have the strength and mechanical properties that you need for whatever you're welding. Now that we've gone over shielding gas and selecting a filler metal, let's talk a little bit about some of the settings. Now on this HTP, it largely takes care of the settings for you. You just pick a program, set the thickness, and you can fine tune the length of the arc. Now on most machines like this titanium MIG, you actually have to dial in your wire feed speed and your voltage on your own. Now there is a chart that can get you started, but I like to be able to dial them in. So we're gonna go over that now, how you might do it. Now when I dial in settings on a weld, rather than just turning knobs here and there as I go, I like to do it in a systematic way. It makes things much quicker and easier. 
And so in order to do that, we're going to pick a wire feed speed that we're gonna be using 350 inches per minute in this example. And I found that that's a pretty good speed for this 1 8 of an inch thick or three millimeter thick material that I'm gonna be welding today. Now I'll start off by setting the voltage a little bit low, 17 volts, and watch what happens. You can see this wire is stubbing out and burning into it, almost like a short circuit MIG, but not quite. It's just not running very smooth and evenly. Now if we turn this up to 19 volts, you can see it's starting to move to what's called a spray transfer where you have that arc sustained all the time. And that's what you're looking for when you're MIG welding aluminum, which is actually different than when you're running most MIG on steel where you're using a short circuit MIG process. I have other videos about that if you wanna check those out. But we're looking for that sustained arc with those fine droplets coming off in a cone. We're starting to see that at 19 volts a little bit, but let's turn it up to 20 and run another bead. And you can see now we have that sustained arc all the time, so we're getting into that spray transfer mode. Now once you're into that mode, going higher in voltage is actually gonna affect your arc length and the length of that cone, and that influences how much that heat spread out, but also how much heat it is. It'll be a hotter arc. Let's turn it up to 22 volts here and go ahead and run this as an example. You can see that there's just a much longer arc. So where you want that arc length to be, that's a matter of personal preference. I'm gonna like running here right in that uh, 19 and a half, 20 volt range that we found sort of in the middle of where we were running, but you can see the weld beads look different in each case but really I'm focused in on how it's actually running in this process that, rather than the bead itself. Now, if you do get it running well and you find that overall it's too hot and it's burning through your material or it's not hot enough and it's just heaped up on top, then you might need to change that wire feed speed up to get a hotter weld or down to get a cooler weld and then dial in the voltage in the same way by repeating the process we just did. Now let's talk about technique, which is gonna have the same principles with either different setup that we're using. And with our technique, there are three main aspects of MIG welding technique. The first is your stick out or the distance from your contact tip up to your work. The second is the angle that you're holding the gun at. And third is your movement, how you're moving along. We'll talk about each one of those one by one. First, let's talk about your distance or your stick out. That's how far your wire is sticking out from this contact tip. Now, if you're running short circuit MIG on steel, which you're probably used to, you're gonna be holding that pretty close you know, somewhere around half an inch or 13 millimeters, maybe even a little closer. Here, we're doing something pretty different. We actually wanna hold a little bit longer distance between our contact tip and our work. That stick out there is gonna be somewhere around three quarters of an inch or 19 millimeters, clear up to, you know, one inch or 25 millimeters. You're gonna be in that range there and you're gonna to wanna to hold that consistent as you go along, but being a little bit longer, is going to work out better here when you're welding aluminum. Next, let's talk about angles. Now with angles, there are two different uh, angles to think about. One is your work angle. Let's say I'm, my hand is a vertical piece and the table is a horizontal piece I'm welding together. Work angle, I'd be going 45 degrees in and out. That's gonna be the same that you would do with pretty much any process. However, in the direction of travel, your travel angle, rather than you know being able to run a drag angle or a push angle, you pretty much need to run a push angle all the time and that lets that shielding gas flood out in front of you and helps you to stay right on the leading edge of that puddle. So maintaining that push angle is pretty important. Now that we've covered holding a longer stick out and keeping that push angle, let's talk about the last thing and that's movement. Now there are a couple of different ways that you can handle your movement. One, you can do a uh, steady movement where you move steadily across. This is a little run I did with the spool gun here on that titanium MIG, and that worked out uh, you know, pretty well moving along, and you'll get a bead that's as smooth and consistent as you are with your movement. Now, rather than just a steady stringer bead like that, I prefer to use more of a stitch motion when I'm MIG welding aluminum, moving back and forth, uh, almost like a whip and pause with a 6010 if you're familiar with stick welding. So with that, I'm moving forward and then back into the puddle, forward and back into the puddle. And you can see I'm doing this in the, with the same settings and the same gun that I just did with that steady result. But instead I get more of that rippled stack of dimes type appearance at the end. It also helps me keep pace and just stay consistent. Here I'll just run another 
example of that with the Pro Pulse here running 5356 filler metal. And then once again, I got that nice rippled appearance and came out with a result that definitely works for me and what I'm doing. So just to review, I'm sure you're sick of me saying it already, but it's so important. I'm gonna go over it one more time. Distance, you need a longer stick out. Angle, you need a push. And your movement, you can either move steadily or use a stitch type motion. Those are the main things that you need to do to be successful MIG welding aluminum once you have your settings dialed in. Now the last thing we'll touch on here is just heat control when you're MIG welding aluminum because aluminum transfers heat really fast and with the amount of heat energy that an aluminum material can hold, a lot of times the material is a very different temperature at the end of your weld than it was at the beginning, right? So if I start off on some room temperature material and weld along, by the time I get to the end of my piece, it's gonna be really hot. And the challenge with that is finding settings that are appropriate for both temperatures. It's really kind of a challenging game. Now, the first way to deal with this is using some preheat. Now, I typically just use a map gas torch for the size of parts that I'm using here. You can also use some kind of an oven or you can use a big rosebud torch if you need to. But this map gas torch, I like this particular one because it outputs 8,000 BTUs, which is twice as much as a typical one. and actually heats parts up pretty quickly. But uh, I usually only heat them up right around 200 or so degrees. It seems to make a difference. I don't wanna go too hot and affect my properties, though I know some people that'll actually increase the heat on that up to you know right around 400 degrees. Um, so that, that kind of depends on what you're working on, how far you wanna go, but a little bit of preheat is gonna help out quite a bit. And what that does is it lets you dial in your settings to run with that warmer temperature and so you don't have such a drastic difference between the start and the finish of your weld. The other thing to do is to stop and let your material and your parts cool off periodically, right? So if you run a weld, you know, move to a different part of your project and then come back over next to it just to let temperatures equal out a little bit. So you have to do a little bit of thinking there to control it. Now, one nice thing on the Pro Pulse is you actually have that remote amperage control so that I'm able to make a change to my settings in real time. So I'm welding on 1 16th of an inch thick or one and a half millimeter thick material. I'm gonna start off with my slider up high and then as I move along, I'm gonna taper it down a little as I feel that uh, material heating up. And then towards the end, I'll taper it way down. And by doing that, I'm able to get a good result all the way along this thin aluminum. So that is a real advantage if you have that available. Um, however, if you don't, you can work around it. It just takes a little bit of thought to try to maintain your temperature as consistently as you can while you're welding. Well, those are the fundamentals of aluminum welding. Hopefully this gives you everything that you need to be able to uh, go out there and weld on your project. If there's anything that uh, you're aware of that I left out, please do us all a favor and let us know down in the comments below. Or if you have any other questions, let us know down there. If you like this video, let me know by hitting that thumbs up below and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.